Dame i gospodo, dobro večer. Drago mi je što vas mogu pozdraviti na jednom iznimno all of the Balkan essays. Tonight with us we have Chris Edgy. <laughs> Editor of the English edition, the man who has collected the majority of these essays, uh, both from manuscripts and from different magazines and books. Then we also have here our important historians, Mr. Tvrtko Jakovina. Dan Jovic. Dan Jovic. And our moderator will be Vuk Peršić, who is the editor of the Croatian edition. I do not see the translators. Yes, they are here, just one of them, Sir John and Hanna Grodnik, translated Butler into Croatian. And we will listen to simultaneous interpretation by our channel 1 for Croatian and channel 2 for English. I leave now the floor over to you with great pleasure, especially to Vuk Perisic to begin. Good evening. We have in front of us a book by an author who is completely unknown to uh, these regions and to our cultural audience. To the same degree that our cultural audience and cultural regions were known to him as an author. A man who came from Ireland and who, because of the Irish historical experience, felt a certain empathy for the historical accidents that were present in the 20th century in the Balkans. His manuscripts and his essays, which were published in many Irish and British publications from 1930s all the way until the end of 1980s, were collected by Mr. Edgy. And I think it is uh, convenient to give him the floor first, as probably the best connoisseur of the works of Hubert Butler, to try to introduce us in a way into his world. Mr. Edgy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vuk. Hvala Vuk, dobro večer svima, jako mi je drago što sam ovdje i mislim da je ovo jedan važan događaj u hrvatskoj i balkanskoj knjižovnoj povijesti. Isto tako na neki neizravan način i veliki događaj za ovog veliko... Then say something about the focus of much of the writing in at least the first suite, uh, part, which is called the Yugoslav Suite, and then reflect on some of his briefly on some of his relevance to uh, contemporary uh, Balkans, especially the former Yugoslavia. In my time, okay. Um, Butler to try to connect um, uh, him to some figures that you might be already familiar with, might be compared with Karl Kraus, Vladimir Nazor, uh, George Orwell, or Albert Camus. These are all writers for whom what might be called the ethical imagination is also a creative imagination. Um, several uh, critics in, in Ireland and Britain have connected him with the tradition of the full ton a kind of engaged, intellectual, quick-witted reportage that's particularly characteristic of Middle Europa. 
So that's the kind of writer he is. He's a very major Irish writer. In my view, he's one of three or four best prose writers, uh, nonfiction prose writers in Ireland of the 20th century, comparable to Yeats in his uh, prose and several other major nonfiction writers. Through some quirk of history, he is now only arriving in the Balkans, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Much of the uh, writing in this book focuses on NDH, Pavlich, and uh, what he believed to be the collaboration of the Catholic Church. He knew Croatian fluently. He lived in Yugoslavia in 1934 to 1937, and he came back many times and researched the NDH period in, um, in, in Tito's Yugoslavia. I think it's important to give everybody just some brief sense of the quality of his writing. So I'm going to read, read a passage that is both brilliant stylistically and suggests the tenor of what he is writing about Pavlich and Stepinac. And then I'll return briefly to some contemporary relevance. When an incendiary sets a match to respectability, it smothers malodorously. But piety, like patriotism, goes off like a rocket. The jackboot was worn by the Croats themselves and used so vigorously against the schismatic Serbs, Serbs that the Germans and the Italians who had established the little state were amazed. Pavlich, the regicide ruler of Croatia, was himself the epitome, the personification of the extraordinary alliance of religion and crime, which for four years made Croatia the model for all satellite states in German Europe. He was extremely devout, attending mass every morning with his family in a private chapel built onto his house. He received expressions of devoted loyalty from the leaders of the churches, including the Orthodox, whose murdered metropolitan had been replaced by a subservient nominee. He gave them medals and enriched their parishes with the plundered property of the schismatics. And he applied the simple creed of one faith, one fatherland, with a literalness that makes the heart stand still. It was an equation which had to be solved in blood. Nearly two million Orthodox were offered the alternatives of death or conversion to the faith of the majority. And there is much else in a piecemeal, piecemeal fashion across the many essays devoted to this theme of mass violence and the corruption of contemporary Christianity. He was not a communist. In fact, he was quite opposed to communism. He was writing from an essentially Christian ethic. And his experience of the files, the archives um, in the 40s, when he read the church newspapers in their entirety, shocked him deeply. And as a result of this, he began to write about this period in Croatia and got in a great deal of trouble in Ireland, Catholic Ireland in the 1950s, for pointing out that the persecution of the Catholic Church by Tito's um, government um, was followed a still greater persecution uh, during the NDH of Orthodox. Jews and Roma. The current best estimates, scholarly estimates by the Holocaust Museum in Washington is 320 to 340,000 Orthodox Serbs killed, at least 25,000 Roma, and uh, definitely 30,000 Jews. Uh, it was a big Holocaust. It was within the top 10 of the 20th century. But some of his other work is just cultural evocations of the Balkans, and particularly Croatia, which he clearly loved. And in several essays, uh, namely The Barriers and uh, The Two Languages, he writes about the survival of a small culture and small nation in a world of big powers. Because, of course, Ireland was a secession state like uh, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, the Baltics after 1918, after its own rebellion. So he's very relevant in that respect uh, to the contemporary issues uh, 
in the former lands of the Yugoslavia. So that is my prologue, and I will now hand over to uh, one of my colleagues. Thank you, Chris. Nedvojbeno je da se na neke povijesne ličnosti i činjenice. This is also the case with, as I could call him, the main character of this book, even though we're not talking about prose, but rather essays, but I do like to use the language of prose even in essays. So the main character is Cardinal Aloysius Stepinac, who in our region is perceived in a completely diverse ways. And this perception one could say is conditioned by emotions. So now I would like to ask Mr. Jovic, to what degree do emotions affect the historiographic perception and by that very fact the political perception? In other words, to what degree is politics as an activity which is supposed to be rational is actually extremely conditioned by emotional perception, especially when we place this in the context of uh, valuing uh, or evaluating the person and the works of Cardinal Stepinas. Good evening to you all. The response to this question is uh, as follows. It depends on from what side of the political spectrum we come from. Of course, there are ideological positions which hold that uh, rationality can in a way control this emotional side or even overcome it completely. But I think it's an illusion. I think that people, when they make decisions, that they do not make decisions only rationally, they also do it emotionally. And they also look at the political and social phenomena even in a way that they do not know or cannot quite explain why. For instance, when you go to elections, it is not uh, um, sometimes you cannot even explain to yourself why you've made a certain choice, whether it was more rational or emotional. But this would perhaps be a general evaluation in lieu of an introduction of what I want to say. I read carefully the book that we are presenting today. I think it has a total of 39 essays, which are uh, were written in the period from 1937 to 1990, which was the last one. The author was born in 1900, and he died in 1991. And out of those 39 essays, and there's actually not a single one which would be completely focused on the uh, uh, person of Cardinal Stepinac, but he is present in even 25 or maybe as many as 30 of these essays. It's enough to see the index of the names and just see how many times he's mentioned. So what is the main idea of the author when it comes to Cardinal Stepinac? I think it's very important because we now go into a phase in which this topic will be very important. There is this commission between the Serbian Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church, uh, which uh, with regard to a possible uh, uh, canonization of Cardinal Stepinas. And as you know, this is a topic that has been turned almost into a sort of a myth, both in the Croatian and in the Serbian public. And if this debate ever takes place, uh, I think this book is excellent to see a more nuanced uh, picture of the person of uh, Aloysius Stepinac. And this is from a uh, an author who does not come from our region. He's not a communist or anti-communist. He's not a Croat or a Serb. And he says for himself that he's a nationalist in such a way that he holds that national states do have their place. He is an advocate of small uh, countries, which Chris has already mentioned. And in that sense, he sees similarities, not so much between Ireland and Croatia as between Ireland and Yugoslavia in the area after 1918. He sees Yugoslavia also as a national state, which was created with the dissolution of an empire. And he compares one and the other from a perspective which is quite lacking in our analysis nowadays. But what is actually uh, this nuance uh, about? 
Butler is actually very critical about the person of Alois Stepinets and his activities. He holds against him from the Christian perspective, first of all, and for him this Christian dimension is very important. So he holds against him mostly his activities or lack of activities in the compulsory conversions of Orthodox to Catholic people in the first years of the NDH. And he quotes something that had not been published at the time. This is Stepinac's letter from November of 1941, which is a letter to Ante Pavelic, where he criticizes him for those procedures of conversions and the fact that they were not uh, done in a way which would be acceptable to the Catholic Church. They were done with the state presence and uh, most frequently with the force of the state itself, which the peanuts holds, which leads to long-term problems because uh, these new Catholics will not uh, be quite immersed in the Catholic faith. But, uh, so this letter is uh, critical, he criticizes Pavelic for this, and he calls him to change his practice and politics. But the butler's problem with this is why Stepinets even holds that such conversions are necessary, and that such conversions are permissible, especially if he knows, and he could not uh, not know, that many of them were forced in order for people to save their own lives. Butler says, couldn't he see what was happening, what happened to Metropolitan Dosite in Zagreb? Didn't he see what happened with the Orthodox population in other places? Didn't he see the violence, which was immense? And how could he then, as a Christian, accept that in that framework, he ins insists or has nothing against, uh, he just talks about the way this was done instead of uh, putting a big question mark on the whole thing. And he uses a very um, uh, it's interesting term, which also is connected with Hannah Arendt and later on the trials for collaboration in the Nazi and fascist times, which is the mildness of uh, evil in Stepin, as he talks about this. Not the banality of evil, but the mildness of evil. Of course, he completely separates Stepinac's position from the position of Artukovic, who is also the subject of one of his excellent, uh, one or two of his excellent essays, where he discovers that Artukovic spent a part of his life in Ireland after 1945, and he goes to talk to the family where Artukovic stayed, and they explain, they describe this uh, gentleman as a very good Catholic who is an anti-communist, and in that sense, he's very acceptable. And no one could believe that he was a minister of the interior in a criminal organization. So Stepinac is not Artukovic, and Artukovic is for him uh, like Himmler, I think. That's the kind of parallel he draws here. But still, there is a serious problem. And it is interesting, as Butler says here, it is interesting that this letter from November 41 was not used in the trial by either side, or either by the prosecution or by the defense, because it was not suitable for either side. Uh, the prosecution did not want to show that Stepinac was critical of uh, Pavelic, but the defense uh, did not uh, was not suited by the fact that he did actually stand behind the policy of uh, compulsory conversions, which for him as a Christian is problem problematic. It's also problematic for him as an Irishman. In Ireland, such things did not happen. And for an individual, a Catholic or a Protestant, this would be a terrible impact on his, or attack on his individualism, on his or her identity, and it would have unimaginable consequences. This is the position from which um, um, he views Stepinac. So, I could also say the following. After the war, Ireland was one of the countries that created the cult of Stepinac and where Stepinac became the victim of the communist system. And in that sense, it is very difficult to write anything against him. And Butler himself has problems. He loses his jobs on several occasions. And he has suffered some, uh, he's under some serious pressure for writing uh, in this way about Stepinac, quite contrary to the dominant 
trend, not just in Ireland, but also in some other Catholic countries of the West. But he says, you are losing sight of the chronology. You accuse him as a victim of communism. But what happened, what I have a problem with, happened at a time when there was no sight of communism in 1941, 1942. What communism? This took place at a time when communists were quite irrelevant. Why? Did he use this time to do these things? Leave communism aside for now. This is a whole lot different episode, and, and there is no dispute about it, even though there is an essay, if I remember well. There is an essay about the peanuts after this, so you will see this very uh, described in a very nuanced way. Also, he goes careful to the archives from 1946 to 1940. I think during 1946 he comes to Zagreb and he enters the archives and he looks at the Catholic press at the time of the Second World War. And there he comes across people who are close uh, associates of the peanuts, not just Archbishop Šarić, but also Šimrak and some other people who were very much involved in the Catholic press on this one side which lost the war. So it's not just the Peanuts himself, but also other characters. So that's more or less the position. Of course, he also presents the Catholic uh, press. He does uh, serious archival research and writes from that position. From me, that is a very interesting approach. I'm not trying to qualify it. Someone uh, can be closed off to this argument. Someone can be quite convinced by it. Uh, many people will not like it. They will think it's a matter of propaganda. But anyone who is actually interested in what actually took place in the 1940s and what type of dimensions and questions and dilemmas we can pose, if we really do want to have a serious discussion and not just propaganda mythology, I think this book will be very useful, at least as a starting point to dispute certain arguments. Because, of course, in the book, as we have seen, Scene. And this was very precisely analyzed in by the editor. There are some uh, errors or mistakes uh, or uh, miswritten uh, uh, facts in the essays. Of course, there are such uh, cases. But I still think that this is a fascinating, excellent beginning of a very serious uh, discussion if we want to move away from just a black and white picture. In that sense, I would like to um, give unreserved recommendation for this book. Mr. Yakovina. In a certain way, Ireland and our region know too little about each other. And uh, because of that, uh, Butler is sort of making a breakthrough in this wall of ignorance. Could you provide some context, perhaps, uh, of the social situation and the atmosphere in which Butler was acting? I'm uh, speaking of Irs, of Ireland, of De Valera, which was neutral during the Second World War, which had a bizarre episode when De Valera went to the German uh, embassy on the occasion of Hitler's suicide. He uh, expressed his condolences and so on. So what kind of a country was it? Now, today, it is a member of the European Union but from 19, uh, 1920s, when it became independent until it acceded to the Union, it lived in uh, relative isolation. What took place there? Good evening to you all. First of all, nowadays it's not just an EU member, it is becoming actually uh, perhaps the third or fourth uh, homeland of young Croats who are increasingly moving out uh, and uh, helping the Irish economic miracle. It is true that Ireland, but at the time even uh, much larger England, was much less known and present than one could even imagine nowadays. And the man who was mentioned several times uh, here with Hubert Butler is Stephen Clisford, who not far from us in what used to be the British Council he used to teach English and uh, also some other there were some uh, many other important um, character or persons from uh, this country and he was actually a British agent who among other things observed what was taking place here so this was one connection and another connection was that Hubert Butler at that time learned uh, Croatian he also lived in some other places and he observed a scene because his arrival coincided with the uh, assassination of King Alexander in Marseille and that moment when he 
is looking at the Archbishop of Zagreb and his first auxiliary, which was Aloysius Stepinas, as they pray next to the king's body. And this is the initial scene, the scene which then uh, got a sort of a reversal because loyalty to one state was continued with Stepinas' uh, loyalty to another state. And it ends with a scene in the military parade in Zagreb after the Second World War, where he's standing next to the highest communist officials. But that episode had a different ending. So Ireland was a very distant country. It was even more distant than was the case with the UK. But at the same time, Ireland was one of the small countries or small nations which could or which were present on a different level. When it comes to Slovenia, as you wouldn't believe it, the Norwegian example was very important because of the Norwegian independence at the beginning of the 20th century. And Ireland was, and owing to one of my students, I by accident came, up, uh, came across a quote, so I'll read it to you now, where an important um, uh, Croatian writer, when he writes about the World Exhibition in Paris, says that since the... Uh, introduction of the uh, Austro-Hungarian settlement, we are nearing uh, poverty. Hungarian trade should depend on ours and not vice versa. And the Croatian Free Sea uh, is about to be kidnapped by an enemy. They are turning our wonderful kingdoms into middle European Ireland into something even worse than Ireland because the English do not claim that Dublin is in England whereas uh, certain Zagreb is, Zagreb is being sold as the Hungarian city in the middle of Paris. This is a quote by A.G. Matos, which in his very polit polemic and not at all politically correct essays, especially when it comes to Hungarians, described in this way uh, at the time, over 120 years, how he saw Croatia and in Croatian connection with Ireland. However, when Butler arrives here in 1930s and... Uh, he sees that many compare Croatia uh, in the kingdom of Yugoslavia with Ulster, even though, as he says himself, it uh, requires quite a lot of uh, combinations in your thinking to switch, uh, to move the Catholicism to Ulster. So it was not a very good um, comparison, but that was the connection. The episode you mentioned, if we skip this time that you have mentioned from with the 1945 and April and one of the relatively shameful events we mentioned in our discussion previously, that's the peanuts until 1941 can get a quite a clear image of what the Second World War is and that his behavior, because once the war, start, war started, is all the less understandable because of it. But the Irish political elites until the April of 1940 when hit or 45 when Hitler killed himself also could have seen more or less what the Third Reich was and then the moves and the 150,000 people uh, protesting uh, for uh, Archbishop uh, Stepinac in Dublin which had been the greatest Irish uh, rally and until that moment was not so much for Stepinac, but was rather a rally for them to clean their unclean conscience because during the Second World War, Ireland played a role which then in 1945 became more problematic than it seemed to have been at the very beginning. However, I think it is important <coughs> And uh, we can say that there's not a lot of this kind of prose in this country. And then he's also mentioned this himself several times. So Butler is not a communist. I can and cannot even say that I felt any per specific sentiment when he wrote about the area of Tito's Yugoslavia and the former kingdom. He is interested in it, but um, he does not uh, embellish anything. He just poses certain logical questions, logical questions which seem to me uh, we do not always need to have a foreigner come here and pose them. One of those logical questions was the question that he sees with Stephen Clisfold, who asks himself, 
is a violent conversion, did the violent conversion of Serbs push them to partisans and that provided for the arrival of um, communists into power? Or what would have happened in the future had Draža Mihailović won? Would um, Cardinal Stepinac have been put on trial? Or when Stepinac was already in prison and he, Butler visited him there and when he says for Catholics, uh, Stepinac is a person in uh, uh, in jail who was much greater than he ever had been in freedom. So if I may mention in a digression, it reminds, reminds me of something I heard yesterday, that Vucic would be happiest in Serbia if he were to be killed like Gingic because he would, it would be um, um, the ultimate martyrdom. But he says something else. There are no indications that he's being treated poorly. I'm convinced that the Yugoslav authorities would be happy to set him free if the Holy See were to accept to be transferred in another country. But the Holy See cannot uh, betray the Yugoslav people. And uh, because of that, its view will not change. And these words were given by the Rijeka, Bishop of Rijeka, Italian Santino, who at the same time as he writes, and this is one of those logical questions, who at the same time, several months or years before that, allowed uh, Italianization of 15,000 Yugoslavs in Rijeka. He withheld any kind of sermons in their mother tongue and so on and so forth. Loyalty to the state and the connection between the state and the nation is what Butler sees both in, our, in the Irish people and in the Croats. But precisely this faith and this great uh, um, attachment to uh, the church, he distinguishes between the faith, uh, uh, which is a faith of, in, uh, of belief in idols and has nothing to do with Christianity, and, what, and between those which are moral, deep questions about uh, the gospel about helping others and so on. He did not see much of that in our region, and the question is uh, how much of it we have nowadays as well. When speaking of Ireland and uh, when speaking of conversion from one faith to another, I would kindly ask Chris to tell us an anecdote from the area of the Great Famine in Ireland in the 1840s. We know that uh, the Protestant and Catholic conflicts were present in this island. How do the Irish see conversions and attempts of conversion? There is even a special term for that which is hard to translate into Croatian. Yes. Um, it would seem that with Butler there were certain lines, and there's a huge ancient contention between Catholicism and Protestantism in Ireland, of course, centered still in Northern Ireland, which belongs to Britain. The island was partitioned, um, a fate which didn't happen to Croatia. Butler was a Protestant, a, a small gentry Protestant, but he was a Republican. He supported the uprising. He was a dedicated, implacable foe of imperialism and the great powers. This book is probably, uh, like Orwell, an exemplar of that. Some of the lines, though, that were crossed had to do with forcible conversion. And um, I suppose Butler was one of those intellectuals who thought, first and foremost, he had to deal with his own side, the rubbish at his own door, as you might say. And he remarks somewhere in this book that there is a historic hatred in Ireland for what is called superism, which was the attempt to convert Catholics to Protestantism during the famine with soup and Bibles. And the uh, conversion campaign, which Evu quite rightly points out in his afterward, is more the focus than the extreme violence, the massacres themselves, seems to have offended him on a deep level because he is a committed nationalism a nationalist. But he defines nationalism in a different way. He defines nationalism as the territory of the state and all its peoples, including the minorities. And he, rep he returns over and over to the concept that the imperial powers manipulate the minorities against the majority. And then when the imperial power 
withdraws, the minority is vulnerable. And so he himself uh, experienced this as an Irish Protestant and a Republican because, of course, after the British review, uh, withdrew from most of Ireland, the Protestants ceased to be the ruling class, more or less, and became a minority. So he's very hard on his own side in Ireland about compulsory conversion. At the same time, he understands exactly the pressure that's under, the Orthodox are under in the new uh, in the new uh, independent state of Croatia. And in a certain sense, he understands the pressure the Croats are under in Yugoslavia by a royalist, authoritarian, Serbian dictatorship. So he, he, he's always focusing on the question of minorities and, and, and majorities, and this is why he's very important for contemporary um, uh, the lands of the former Yugoslavia. I'd just like to pick up one thing that Dehan said, which will illustrate something about Butler. He, like Orwell, has an enormous uh, recollection of small details. In fact, Dehan was a little bit too easy on, on Butler. Butler does not exonerate Pavlich for his letter of so-called protest in November 1941. Butler says that this resolution was an attempt to check the rule of violence that the church itself had encouraged in April 1941. And he translates this resolu it, it, the documents that it, are in an essay called The Compulsory Conversion Campaign in 1941. He translated for the first time in English in the 50s two documents. One was the letter to Pavlich, the so-called letter of protest, and one was the actual resolution by the bishops. If you study carefully this document, both in Croatian and, and English, you will see that pa um, uh, Stepinac does not actually criticize Pavlich. He says explicitly that Pavlich himself and the NDH are exempt from criticism. And it's just some rogue elements, some violent people who didn't know really what they should be doing. So he exonerates the regime. In November 1941, uh, which is uh, uh, six months after the violence, when historically, as Slavko Goldstein points out in his, his great book, 1941, the year that keeps returning, the violence had largely spent itself. Hundreds of thousands of Serbs had um, um, been killed by that point. So he questions whether this is a genuine letter of protest. The way Stef uh, uh, Stepinac handles it, he quotes several of his other bishops. He quotes four bishops, particularly the Bishop of Mostar, who is very critical. But none of the church, he points out, said, let us stop this conversion campaign. There can be no legitimate conversion in a, in a time of war where there are seven armies on the lands of Yugoslavia. It is not possible. The church should, get, should have proposed the concept. And therefore, he takes one further jump, which is that it was basically using the violence of the times as an occasion for proselytism. And he has a one-sentence conclusion, which more or less will deal with his... I, I just read this one sentence. I think it's important. This is his conclusion. Roughly speaking, one may say that the bishops were enthusiastic about the quizzling Pavlich himself and saw in his advent an admirable opportunity of extending the domain of the Catholic Church but were horrified when they found by what brutal methods the campaign was to be conducted. It was then too late for them to withdraw their support. No one was excommunicated. So he, he in fact does not, I think I would disagree with Dehan, does not exonerate Stepinac. He accuses him of connivance is the word in English. He is perhaps what... Um, as Slavko Goldstein um, describes in his book as a liberal Ustashi. During the early part of the regime, there were a number of Ustashi, quite respectable, proper, cultured people who thought the new regime, the new order could be imposed with some uh, relevance to due process and, and some kind of legal order. Many of those liberal Ustashi were actually killed themselves. So he never abandoned the Stepinats never abandoned the support of the NDH. He supported it right to the end. And effectively, I argue in my introduction that he is a kind of ecclesiastical 
equivalent to a liberal Ustasha, not actually Ustasha, not a member of the movement. He more comes from the Frankist tradition, but that he never broke with the fundamental extreme nationalism of the regime. Uh, Hubert Butler za sebe otvoreno kaže da je nacionalist. Quite frankly for himself that he's a nationalist. He has great sympathy for the Irish independence movement, for independence as, it's, as such. He is very sympathetic of the small Eastern European nations, their political aspirations and their cultures, on one hand. On the other hand, we see a man who is completely inclusive, who, if we are to use the present-day language from the point of view of human rights, there are no doubts about the respect for civic freedoms and individual rights. Mr. Jovic, is this a different, unknown to us, form of nationalism? Is it some sort of term in a German confusion? How does he reconcile? nationalism and empathy for the other. Has nationalism evolved or devolved? Did it used to be better? Did it have democratic potential? Has it lost its democratic potential? I think that many terms and notions, including nationalism, are conditioned by the context and by a certain uh, communication situation. Persons who are linguists and communicologists know much more about this than I do, but in different contexts they have different meanings. And I also, when I was reading this book, thought that perhaps the term or notion of nationalism could have been translated in a different way into Croatian. But then, of course, the question was how? What do I mean by this? We also had the confusion about the term nation, how to translate it. I always believed that we mistranslate the term nation always and solely as a people. For instance, we have United Nations, uh, which are not actually United Peoples, it's United States. And we have international politics, which is interstate politics, not interpeople politics, that we insist on translating the term nation in the way that we are used to translating it. And in that context, of course, it's now different, difficult to change. When it comes to this question of inclusiveness of nationalism, in the perspective of the English language, nationalism does not have the political um, nuance that it may have here, partly under the influence of uh, nationalist political or, uh, projects like uh, Marxism or Socialism, where it uh, gained a very negative connotation. So nowadays, when you call someone a nationalist, or if you come from the liberal left, it's automatically some sort of an insult. I would be more prone to uh, looking at terms uh, neutrally, so it's legitimate for someone to be nationalist. If it's a na if he's a nationalist, it doesn't mean he's a bad guy or a violent. There are different types of nationalism, as we well know. And in that sense, I would rather be a neutral. Everyone has a legitimate right of being nationalist. Uh, but in our case, in our communication, there are too many lines between us and them based on such determinants. Instead of saying, look, it's legitimate for someone to be nationalist or unitarist or separatist or something else, but it's never legitimate for one to use violence. So the line is not about whether one is a separatist or a unitarist. It's legitimate to advocate for secession or for unification, but it's not legitimate to use violence for any of those ideas. I'll give you an example. As some of you know, I lived in Scotland for 10 years where a nationalist party party is in power, which is a separatist also party. Separatism in Scotland is not legally prohibited. There is no law to prohibit the pro propaganda of separatism. Even more, it's uh, admissible to have a referendum on independence. It's permissible for the uh, ruling party to say, we don't want the United Kingdom, we want to get out. But what would be prohibited if, was, uh, if they were to take arms, as was the case with IRA or some similar organizations. 
but also with the Unitarians who take up arms. It doesn't matter if they attack someone to preserve the state or to leave the state. It doesn't matter what reason you're using violence and weapons for. Everything is uh, legitimate. I think from our point of view, this is quite a different matter. From our point of view, for instance, secessionism is almost always prohibited. It was prohibited in the Yugoslav context. Nobody wanted to talk about secessionism as a legitimate political idea. But at the same time, it was believed that it's allowed to use weapons for unitarianism. In my view, this is the same thing, uh, and it's also happening in Croatia. We also um, have uh, parts uh, where if somebody wants to, says we want autonomy in Croatia, you will end up in court if you try to do this. But the same thing happens uh, with the unification. If you want to get unified in Yugoslavia, for instance, against you will end up in court because it's uh, against the constitution. So confederation is prohibited by the constitution. So in that sense, I would be much more cautious. The Scottish nationalists are in that sense more similar to what uh, Butler's position is, which is inclusiveness and absolute prohibition of violence. So violence is a major problem in that sense and not what you are advocating for. And that would be my answer to this question. Unfortunately, I think we are quite far from this uh, because in our country, terms are very much contaminated. If you think that nationalism is always violent, then of course you will prohibit nationalism. If you think that it's anything else, then you will act differently. Mr. Yakovina. Balkan essays as a historiographical source, of course, not a primary or secondary source, but as a sort of a collateral historiographical source, which provides us with an insight into how this area was seen from a different uh, spatial and temporal context. So an Irishman from the 1930s writing about Yugoslavia and writing about Yugoslavia in the 1940s as well. We are reading this nowadays and we get a, a different perspective, both Irish and temporal. How useful is Butler in that sense? Well, thank you for that question. As uh, someone who teaches world history, I'm happy to see when somebody sees this. And I also keep repeating this in the context of Croatian historiography, that the view from inside, from our narrow, uh, environment to what happens to us is the wrong way to do it. It leads us to wrong conclusions, it's very often uh, uh, senseless, and as Butler says here also, if you lie about the unpleasant things in your past, does this mean that you allow others to do the same thing? And then why would you be upset about somebody else's similar action or behavior? Or as he says in one place, that for churches it has become normal to lie later on about some things that were bad and then a step further is that they pretend this did not even happen or that this was distorted by the communists or that these were understandable crimes or that perhaps they are exaggerated. In that essay, he also mentions the, atten uh, the uh, attempted assassination of Rolovic. So the thing is that the things who, which happened in our country and related to our country are described by some other people who are interested in us, who know how to read, who know how to see. They ask those questions. The diplomacies ask those questions. What I'm always astonished by in our context is why do we like to pretend here that if we close our eyes, then nobody will see it. It hasn't happened. That some logical questions will not be posed. I think that uh, through this, uh, he is most interesting civilization Wise. Not all the essays are political here. Let's be clear that he also speaks about Montenegro and about the blood feud, about reconciliation or Izmirenje, as they call it. He describes Skopje, he describes Split, Belgrade at the time. 
in a quite uh, uh, on a quite uh, unpolitical level, but the political level is also important. The civilization level is also important. But perhaps I'm saying this because uh, I'm not uh, quite aware of this uh, part. But if he asks uh, some questions as a Christian that I do not encounter around us, he poses questions and he says, "Do you know that it's not good to do evil to others? Do you believe?" Uh, in what is actually written in the holy books and how do you relate to that. He distinguishes, as I have mentioned previously, between the primitive instinct in faith and the mind in faith, the empty spirit towards the one who really wants to be a believer. And that's why he asks certain questions which trouble him very much. He's troubled what why happened here. But on the other hand, I'm a bit troubled by something that uh, could perhaps end up in some of our books when he says that none of the uh, Orthodox bishops did not survive except one who was his friend and then left. Uh, this is perhaps a piece of information which could be quite useful when we speak about the Second World War and relationship towards other religious communities in general. Or certain other you know, things that he mentions in this way. For instance, something that we m may have heard in the last few days. I think when I was working on my PhD, this was something more uh, near to me, but he speaks here about the Bishop of Giacomo. Uh, who during World War II printed pamphlets in which he warns Serbs in Slavonia, there were about 16% of them at the time, uh, convert to the faith being offered to you now, the true faith. But the same bishop after Second World War is a collaborator with Tito's regime. His image, his photograph is in the papers, and he was necessary to this regime, just as he was necessary to the regime during World War II. So this he has a problem with this type of behavior of the church. The church um, are to tend to approve too many things for the authorities, for the government. Then he also asks the question whether the church or the Vatican, since it has excommunicated Tito, it may have excommunicated uh, Pavel, but failed to do so. Mr. Edgy, we are nearing the end of this round table. Tell us a few words about um, Butler's view of national cultures, of uh, national, natural, ethno national color, uh, cultures of the Eastern European type and about the significance of their openness and interaction with others. Just, uh, I will answer that question. It's a very important question to end the uh, round table on. Um, I just want to underscore, because we've been talking about Steppy Knots and ecclesiastical history and so forth, how wonderful these essays are as works of writing and how much it is worth buying the book just to see a essayist at the top of its form, his form. Um, there is the kind of high drama of an essay called The Conversion Campaign, Compulsory Conversion Campaign in 1941. There's a kind of detective story in the Artukovic file. There's a wonderful poetic evocation of Dalmatia in 1937 where he talks about how unspoiled it is, and you must go now before it is unspoiled. Well, I know Dalmatia very well, it's still unspoiled, so go now. Um, so, um, and there are wonderful uses of primary sources, which of course my colleagues are very interested in as historians. I mean, if you, care, if you compare closely Father Chalk and compulsory conversion, when Butler visit, visits Stakada in Lika and talks with the father and sees what happened at the ground level and sees the leaflet that was issued by the, um, by the Bishop of Jacobo. And then, amazingly, as if to end this parable, I would call it is a kind of parable. I write about this in the introduction. He, Butler was interested in a kind of modern form of parables which are applicable not just in Croatia or in Ireland but universally. And this is really about a parable, Stepinas is the parable of the organizational man. 
the organization man that Hannah Arendt talks about, ecclesiastical version. So all his writing has a, a parabolic quality. But it ends in the most amazing essay called A Visit to Lepaglava, where Butler actually interviews Stepinats in prison. It is like Chekhov going to Siberia. The, the author interviews the subject of his writing. It's a wonderful essay and highly important because in Father Chalk, he shows that the church did issue commands and threats. The, the leaflet is threatening. It says the Serbs will lose their husbandry and farms if they don't convert, and perhaps one might deduce their lives. It's very clear. He sees it in their church documents. But um, Stepinat says famously, notre conscience est tranquille, or my conscience is clear. So there's, there's a fundamental contradiction, and this is the parable of the writing. So to take Vuk's um, uh, question, he's very important in two essays called The Two Languages and the Barriers. In the barriers, he basically says there's no such thing as a pure national culture. A, a, a nationally distinct culture must have cultural discourse with other cultures. Otherwise, it recall, or recall, uh, recoils into bitterness, pedantry, and linguistics. That does sound like BCS. Um, so he's very good on the, the, the need for a national culture to be inclusive. It needs cultural discourse. And he points out in this essay that by closing down connections with um, some other small cultures in an interwar period, the new secession states ended with the opposite of cultural self-sufficiency. In the second essay, The Two Languages, he talks about, in a very complex way, which I won't try to summarize, he talks about what actually holds together a community, a nation, a people, a small state. It's the most wonderfully sophisticated uh, an analysis of this question. Um, his faith in small um, nations has to do with something with the fact that they're closer to earlier communities than the great federations. Um, so he is very, very important on the idea of cultural exchange. And therefore, these essays, especially towards the end of the section um, called um, um, The Cultural Pattern, um, the second part, he's very good uh, on these kinds of cultural exchanges. And as a result, the book is not just about the Balkans then. It's also about the Balkans now. And I do think that Hubert Butler joins Rebecca West, whatever you think of her, and another very fine English writer, Anne Bridges, uh, who wrote a book called Illyrian Spring, as one of the great um, um, English language writers that really now should belong not only to the English language, but to the Balkans. Uh. Thank you, Chris. Hvala, Chris. Možda bismo mogli ipak aktualizirati malo pitanje percepcije Stepinca i značaja Stepinca and the significance of Stepinac for Butler and this book through the procedure of canonization that Mr. Jovic perhaps wanted to say a few words about. Okay, to end with, because I think we are nearing the end of this round table, but allow me just to say that Stepinac is a, a large and serious topic, and even though in a very early stage of my life and public activity I had some uh, contact with this topic, because as a boy, since I was 16 years old, I guess, uh, I remember my first the journalistic um, uh, works and one of them was my interview with Yakov Blažević, uh, which uh, very few people know was an interview done by me, perhaps, and I think it was my first interview. And then he said in this interview those important two sentences, which is that, let me just remind you that, in, and if any of you don't know, Yakov Blažević was the state prosecutor of the People's Republic of Croatia, and he represented the suit against Stepinac in 1946. 
in when he stopped being the president of the presidency of Croatia, which he was from 74 to 82, and three or four years after that, he gave an interview to a young journalist of the magazine called Polet, namely me, as it happens. And in this interview, he said that Stepinac, had he been more flexible, the trial would not have been necessary. And we proposed to him that uh, he should separate the Catholic Church uh, from Vatican and bring it closer to the people. This was later on interpreted as a formal uh, separation of schism, but then he explained that he did not really mean that, but rather to uh, separate it politically from uh, the Vatican and make it closer to the nation. This was my first contact with that. And then later on, uh, uh, this uh, interview received great attention because it was seen as an admission of the public prosecutor. And then later on, having worked on the documents from the Tito's archive, which I had the uh, opportunity to see in Belgrade, I saw three letters of the peanuts to Tito in 1945, and all three were more or less about the property issues. You talk, you took this from us or that from us, and there was one uh, uh, Tito's letter of response, which uh, said basically that, well, if you don't hold up the agreement, then we won't either. And then, due to certain circumstances, I read a book, Unconventional Perception, by Stevan Pavlovich, who is completely, almost completely unknown in our country, and it contains a fantastic chapter about a lieutenant of the Yugoslav Royal Army, Stanislav Rapotec, who was a Slovenian painter. He died in 87 in Belgrade, and he was known and mentioned in that chapter as a person who, in agreement with the Yugoslav royal government, secretly, with the help of the a British submarine, which um, uh, took him to Brač in 1942 in April, and he came to first to Brač, then to Split, and then to Zagreb, and talked to Stepina several times. And he reported on this to the royal government. And he had contacts with a secret organization of Serbs in Zagreb, which I don't think anyone else had ever heard about later on, who also gave their opinion of Stepinac at the time. And this report is relatively unknown. Rapotec says, I came with an extremely negative view of Stepinac, but I returned with a slightly less negative view, but still negative. He was the first, actually, one to report to the royal government about the camps that he had heard about, that they were talked about, and about people disappearing. I think not many of these things are familiar to people. I think in this new procedure we'll see a lot of those new documents and evidence coming up. I think on both sides there's a lot of demand for documents which are not yet publicly known. I'm sure that the Orthodox Church wants the Vatican archives to be opened to see the correspondence between the Pilots and Pius XII, uh, which is not available as far as I know, or which should at least make the situation more clear for the Commission. And there is also a book of uh, journals uh, written by Stepinac himself or by his associates, which was allegedly still unavailable, and allegedly it is in Belgrade. And the majority of the previous documents I mentioned were in Zagreb, but one of them is in Belgrade also. So it is up to us how we are going to accept this. Um, if we say, well, I don't want to hear any arguments that I don't agree with, and again, we'll see a war about selective interpretation of data and information. But if we want to be serious, then we'll put on the table everything and consider it in context. And in that sense, I think that this book is very helpful because it gives an external eye, so to speak, which is very much necessary and which is very sophisticated. It breaks down certain prejudices we have or barriers, black and white barriers. For instance, if you can be nationalist but still be opposed to any kind of violence, any kind of uh, uh, thing. And, for instance, somebody who sees that uh, those compulsory conversions were something used by someone during the war to achieve a certain objective. This is what I expect to see happening. In that sense, this book is very, very useful. Mr. Yakov, Yakovina, uh, final thoughts. Um, if Bayan is expecting that we will approach objectively new documents and that we even need new documents, then he can hope till... Uh, um, 
hell freezes over, but it will not happen. So when uh, this problem with the peanuts began, then those who uh, completed the process of research and proved that he's a Catholic saint in the Catholic Church said that the research procedure is completed and finished. So any new interference will just uh, extend this and probably open up uh, questions. However, some of those questions are as I've tried to say several times, the questions have been asked even in a country in which there were 150,000 people rallying for the peanuts, which also shows more or less what democracy means, regardless of uh, Butler's problems of being expelled from the archaeological society he had established because he had insulted uh, the papal nuncio at the time and so on. But these were questions which were there on the table which were posed and uh, perhaps most tragically for all of us here those questions to this very day have not been answered and the problem with both our historiography but also our society is that um, we uh, do not really want to hear the answer to certain unpleasant questions if you have some higher objective or you cannot accept the uh, response. Perhaps the responses and the answers are not too important. Perhaps it's just important to ask the questions. How do you with this, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you once again to Chris G. We also have here with us Johnny Gogan, the man who made a great documentary whom you may have uh, had an opportunity to see here about uh, Hubert Butler, and I hope this but this book will uh, encourage some discussions and that this other point of view will be something that uh, we can use to see ourselves as well. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow at the festival.